think that's what some of us view faith as. We view faith as like, just ignore the facts, just deny them, just sweep them under the rug. But again, faith reinterprets the data through the lens of God's character and word. Abraham is a great example of someone who did not deny the facts, he just didn't let the facts set the bar for his faith. Because very often we believe the lie that says, you can't care for others until you're fully taken care of. But while I feel like I have unmet needs, God will very often call you to sacrificially give your time, give your energy, give what little finances you have, because why? You trust that even though he has not yet met your needs, Many Christians misunderstand what faith and hope really are. And maybe you've never heard this, but faith and hope are different things according to the scripture. If you've ever wondered how faith should inform our perspective and our way of life, this is the video for you. See, the world wants to convince you that you don't have enough and God is not enough for you. But often God is calling us to a higher level of faith and he's inviting us to rise above our current circumstances the way Paul and Abraham demonstrate. You're about to see what real faith looks like and you might just understand faith in a completely different way. Let's jump into the message. When Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, it is very interesting to me that the primary reason he rejoices is Jesus and not the money that God gave him. So in other words, he's, he views God as the source of his joy, as the reason for his rejoicing, not the money God has provided. And not only is God the source of joy in this passage, but God is the source of provision. Uh, Paul's provision is not sourced in the Philippians, in the Philippian church. They are not the source of his needs being provided for. God is. They are just the, the means by which God provides Paul um, or supplies Paul what he needs. And so they become a vessel, a, a, a river through which God extends his financial blessing to Paul. But the Philippian church, they're stewards, they're managers, they're the means that God intends to use. The method of God's supply is the Philippian church, but God is the source. And I think just when, when we talk about money, because inevitably that's going to come up in conversation when you look at this passage. Because Paul is saying, I did have need. <laughs> I'm not denying that. I had tremendous need. But I was not in need. I was content. These are just two competing perspectives and state of beings right here in verse 11. He, he says, I, I'm not being in need. That's not the, the place that I'm speaking from. Now, I, I know how to be content. And so there are two competing mentalities there are two competing state of beings, states of being. One is I'm constantly in perpetual need, waiting for God to do something so I can be okay, waiting for someone to do something about my problem, then I can be okay. And I kind of place my peace and joy in the hands of another person. And I'm just in perpetual need. Or even if I attribute that to God, I'm waiting for God to do something as if he hasn't done enough in his son. That's one way of living and existing. The other one is I am content. I'm in a perpetual state of contentment, which means that apparently contentment cannot be and is not based on our state of affairs, right? To be in need assumes that you're only as good as your life affairs, but to be content means, no, my state of being transcends my circumstances, Verse 12, I know how to be brought low, how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret. Paul wears contentment and joy like, like this beautiful shirt, this garment he puts on, this radiating light kind of garment. He puts on Christ, puts on his thinking, puts on his attitudes, puts on his word, and then lets the ways of God guide his decision-making process. And that's how he faces every situation. And what's interesting is verse 14 gives us more insight into how Paul thinks about his needs. So, so I, I hope that you will rethink, reframe your financial needs or whatever you're qualifying as a need in your life. Usually, for a lot of us, it is financial lack. It is financial need. If I just had more money, I could deal with the other issues in my life. Not to say that money solves everything, but sometimes in our minds, we view money as that kind of fix-all solution. Like if I could just have more money, a lot of the problems in my life would be erased. And Paul does not view money like that. In fact, he gives us 
insight into how he sees money. He says, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And, and I love the honesty of Paul. He does not deny his legitimate trouble. He does not deny the facts of his situation. I think that's what some of us view faith as. We view faith as like, just ignore the facts, just deny them, just sweep them under the rug. Don't look at the actual statistics and the data of your life. Whereas I think faith just interprets the data properly. Faith becomes the, the, the lens through which I am interpreting my life and experiencing my world and conclu- making conclusions about the things I'm facing, right? I'm interpreting the data through the lens of faith. In fact, this is what Romans chapter 4, this is supposed to be a group Bible study, but if y'all don't jump in, it ain't my fault. Romans chapter 4, it says this in verse 18, Abraham is a great example of of someone who did not deny the facts, he just didn't let the facts set the bar for his faith. Which many of us end up doing that. We either completely dismiss the facts and live in delusion and ignorance, or we only believe as far as the facts give us reason to. We let the the the, the circumstances of our lives determine how much I'll believe God for. That's not what Abraham does in Romans 4, though. It says, in hope, in this kind of eager expectation, it's not a wishful thinking. It's a confident, this will happen. In that hope, he believed against hope. So just like we saw in Philippians 4, these these two competing realities, two competing modes of existing, two competing ways of thinking, I'm in perpetual need or I'm in a place of contentment focusing on all that I have to rejoice about. Well, there's two competing hopes here. There's what God says Abraham should hope in. And then there's the facts of Abraham's life that tell him how far he can hope. And these, there's two competing hopes, essentially. And in his hope in the word of God, he believes against the measure of hope that his life gives him reason to have, that he should become the father of many nations. That's what Abraham believes for. So what is it that Abraham, uh, let me say it like this. Abraham's hopes and faith are different things. Faith and hope, not the same thing. Faith informs my hope and my hope is in the direction of my faith, right? Right? But faith and hope are not the same exact thing. They're they're different. And so Abraham has faith in the word of God. He has faith in the promises and the character and the goodness of God. And that informs the direction that he's going to hope and what he's going to hope in. He's going to hope in the word of God. And in that kind of hope, He's believing, I'm going to be the father of many nations. Because God told him in verse 18, so shall your offspring be. Abraham is not hoping in a set of things that he just imagined himself. Abraham, in other words, what Abraham is hoping in, it does not originate within himself. He doesn't just design this future for himself and drop the blueprint and then slap God's name on that and say, I'm hoping he'll do this. No, no, no. God originated this whole thing. God began this plan. And then he comes to Abraham, shares this plan, gives him a promise, and Abraham can either believe in that or not. And Abraham's hope is now in the direction of what God can do, not in what his body can produce. And this does have an influence on how we view not just our financial affairs, but our circumstances in general. Watch. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Now, just like Paul says, I had legitimate trouble. He does not deny his trouble. This is what many of us do in the name of faith. 
I'm just going to ignore the problems of my life and ignore the situations I'm in and ignore the weaknesses I'm facing and the and the ailments and the and the the, the temptations and the constant nagging of the spiritual warfare. I'm just going to ignore it all in the name of faith. But again, faith does not ignorantly turn away. Faith reinterprets the data through the lens of God's character and word. So, so now the facts of my life take a back seat to the character, the word, and the promises of God. That's what's primary. That, that is what is ultimate. So now I'm looking at my situations in light of this backdrop called the promises and the goodness and the character and the word of God. That's what Abraham does. He doesn't go... I will just ignore the fact that I cannot have children physically and my wife's dusty womb cannot produce children. Let me just ignore the facts. He doesn't do that. He considers it. His, his body's as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And he didn't waver in faith or weaken in faith when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. There are two things Abraham is said to be considering here. He's not ignoring them. He is not ignoring the facts. He's interpreting them through the lens of faith. Faith allows you to reinterpret the data that you will come across all day, every day. Faith allows you, and it's not delusion, it's not ignorance, it's what is ultimate reality. Well, what God says and what is eternal. Okay, so now look at life through the lens of those things. Reevaluate your situations through the lens of those things that don't change. So Abraham goes, my wife has dusty womb. I am old. We cannot produce children. There is no way we could possibly have a child on our own. Okay, he's still not weakening in faith because his hopes were not in the direction of what his own body or his wife's body could produce. His hope is in the direction of what God can do. So what sets the bar for Abraham's faith? His situations, his ability, his knowledge, his education? No. What sets the bar of his faith is the God that has intervened and interrupted Abraham's life and said, here's a promise, here's a future, now walk with me. That's what Abraham is looking to. That's who he's looking to. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He grew strong in his faith. As he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is what we see demonstrated in Paul here. Paul does not deny his trouble. Paul believes God is good in the midst of his own constant needs and suffering and persecution and imprisonment and wondering and potential doubt and will God. And he's believing God is good in the midst of this. What God will do here? Not sure. But the Philippian church shares his trouble. I love that. Right there, P Paul admits, I had trouble. And someone saw the trouble he was in. And even in the midst of their own problems, even with their own baggage. Again, th this is not a community of, uh, you know, wealthy individuals. If you go to the, you know, the origin of the church in Philippi, Paul does meet... Um, What's her name? A worker of, of, of Scarlet or something like that. What is her name? Put it in the chat. The first convert in Philippi outside the city. Um, man, her name escapes me. But she definitely has, is wealthy. She definitely, like, con Lydia, thank you. Thank you, Claudine. She contributes to the ministry of Paul. But the church in general, the way that Paul speaks about them, I believe in 2 Corinthians doesn't make it sound like they are just abounding financially. Either way, this church, the churches in this region, are giving out of their extreme poverty. I really, really, really want you to think about this. Hey, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have some free gifts for you on our website at abovereproachministry.com. Maybe you want to learn how to study the Bible. We have free Bible classes just for you.
Are you maybe a newer believer? Go ahead and check out our Christianity 101 Foundations course. Maybe you hate videos. Well, we have a podcast, so you can listen to all of our messages on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Maybe you want to join or start a discussion group. Check out our map of all the current armed discussion groups all around the world. And do you maybe live near Greenville, South Carolina? If you do, you should check out our church. Visit movementchurchsc.com for more information. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can snag a copy of my book, Fruitful. Or head over to the donate page and donate through debit or credit card, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, Patreon, or even mail a check to P.O. Box 509 Inman, South Carolina. And if you want to make a ministry connection, feel free to reach out to me on our website. All right, I know that was a lot, but I'm done. So let's get back to the video. Contrasted with Mark 12, 44, where the people are giving out of their wealth and their surplus. It is, it's pretty easy to be like, I have a lot of leftover money. I could give that to somewhere to something, to someone, to some group, an organization. It's another thing to go, we have extreme poverty right now. And we're not viewing it as lack. We're not viewing it as not enough. We're viewing it as enough to do something for someone else in the hands of God. It goes back to the John chapter 6. Jesus multiplying the bread and the fish. Little boy brings a lunch. Little boy doesn't dis, uh, what's it called? Minimize what he has to bring. He doesn't say, this is not enough to feed the crowds. He says, this is enough for God to work with. And it's a very, that's a very different perspective when it comes to financial affairs. Is, do you look at what you have as not enough for A, B, and C? Or do you look at it as enough to do what God wants me to do today and to advance his kingdom? It's enough. That you, you can change the way you look at what you have in your hands. And when you change the way you look at it in light of who God is and what he can do, you will use, you will do something different with what's in your hands instead of sitting on it, instead of just minimizing it. And diminishing what God could do with it and going, I don't know, like, this isn't... You, you could say, I don't have enough for bills this week, potentially. I'm not saying this will all happen to us. But I'm saying, in a hypothetical scenario, if God calls you to give to that struggling family down the street and buy them dinner, and you say, I don't have enough for bills this week, there are two ways you can look at it. You can look at it as not enough for my own needs currently, or you can look at it as enough to do what God commanded me to do with what he put in my hand. Because we're all stewards anyway. That's all we are. I'm managing what he's placed in my hands. I'm not the owner. I'm not the owner. And so in some weird, radical way, this church, this group of churches goes, we're in extreme poverty. And that overflows into abundance and generosity on their part, that is, that is fascinating. That's what's happening in Philippians chapter 4 when Paul's needs are met. And I'm not saying that there's no wisdom in managing and looking at the data and, and structuring out what we have for bills this week. And, but if God says to do something with what you have in your hands and you're not, because you're focused on what it can't do and what needs it can't meet and what needs you currently have, I would just say, Ask God for the faith to do what he's told you to. Because apparently, even in the midst of your own financial lack and needs not being met, you can tend to someone else's needs. Apparently. Uh, we, we, are, we are drowning in consumerism. This consumeristic mentality of, I'm just on the receiving end. I just want, I need, I need to get, I need to be constantly looking for things that I can have for myself. And it's, it's killing us. It really is. It's killing us and robbing us of this uh, faith-filled life of abundance that says it's enough because at the end of the day, everything that we come across is telling you, you don't have enough. You need more. You don't have enough. Here, let me give you what you really want. And then we bring that to God and we view him through that lens of consumerism and we say, yeah, you know what? I should be on the receiving end all the time. God, where are you at? And then slowly... You can find yourself, like, for weeks having an unmet need or having an unresolved issue or having a, a, a whatever it is that you're waiting for God to deal with and you're going, I'm waiting for God to deal with this before I do anything for Him. 
And I would just like to suggest that possibly, not always, but sometimes, the way that God intends to meet your needs, the way that God intends to deal with your problem and solve that issue that you're waiting for him to, is through your obedience and care for someone else. Because you, you can, you really can be ministering with what you have, what gifts, what experience, what knowledge, what education, what understanding, what, what, what do you have? Not just materially, but, but anything you can offer. What energy, what time, what understanding of God do you have that you can use to benefit the lives of others while you are still sitting in your own needs and issues? That's a question that we should all be asking ourselves. Because very often we believe the lie that says, you can't care for others until you're fully taken care of. And I'd just like to suggest that that's not necessarily how God works. While I feel like I have unmet needs, God will very often call you to sacrificially give your time, give your energy, give what little finances you have to care for the affairs of others and make their lives better. Because why? You trust that even though he has not yet met your needs, he cares for you and he will. It's a preemptive strike. That's what it is. It's, I know he will, so I'm going to move in faith knowing he's faithful. So Paul says, you, you shared in my trouble. Thanks, guys. That's awesome. Love it. No one, in fact, you Philippians yourselves know in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church. So I guess the Philippian church is in the region of Macedonia. Just speaking, just making sense of what Paul's saying here. He left that region and they're the only ones that gave out of that region. So they must be a part of the churches listed in 2 Corinthians. No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you guys. How, how could a group of people look at the little that they have? And again, this is not just financially, but in this context, it, it is. How could they go? This is, we are impoverished. We don't have enough for our daily needs or for whatever it is that we think we need. But Paul has needs. And we would like to give to Paul. Because we trust God takes care of us, and he will, even though we haven't seen it yet. And there's a bunch of, on, a, on the shelf of our lives, there's a lot of unanswered prayer requests. There's a lot of things God hasn't done for me yet. And you can either magnify those things and live in perpetual need, only focusing on the things God has not yet done, or you can live with a focus on all that God has already done and given us in His Son, all that He's promised, all that He's said, all that He is in the midst of the things that have not yet been resolved and fixed and the needs that have not been met yet. You and I have a, face, a, a choice to make each and every day. One of those choices is what will you magnify? The things that God has not yet done, the needs you still have, the unresolved issues and addictions of your life, or will you magnify what God has done, the good, the positive, the faithfulness of God, the promises of God? Because apparently this Philippian church is not waiting for God to give to them before they begin to contribute to Paul. And I think we get it twisted. I'm waiting for God to do this for me, then I'll be faithful to him. Nah, brother, if he told you to obey, if he told you to do something very clearly and you know it's him and you keep justifying disobedience, you probably won't see what you're believing for as you sit in complacency and disobedience, not managing well what he's given you. We always have something to manage. You ever thought of it like that? I know this is turning into a sermon, but y'all ain't contributing anyway, so... <laughs> Everything you have in your hands... Everything that you have in your life is something that God can potentially use. There's potential within everything that you have. There can be positive and negative potential to, to a lot of things too. But everything I have is something to give. There, there is always something I could be using for the good of another. And it's amazing the people that often have the least do the most with what they have. And sometimes we're so cluttered. Our houses are just bursting at the seams 
with all the stuff we have. So much so that we go and rent storage space for all the stuff we're never going to use that our children are going to inherit because we need a space for our stuff that we're never going to touch. And it becomes all about receiving and gaining and acquiring and we become nothing more than over-cluttered, you know, hoarders instead of using and, and putting to work the little that we have or even the lot that we have, we just sit and accumulate. That's not what Paul's doing in prison. You know what Paul could have done? He could have just received the money and been like, cool, and not said a thing. Could have just left it at that and said, the Philippian church knows I love them. That's why they brought me money. But he takes the time in his own suffering, in his imprisonment, in wondering when or if he'll ever get out, and he chooses to give of himself to encourage that local community. So it's reciprocated, isn't it? That They're giving out of their poverty. He's giving out of his suffering. Why do we wait for life to be good enough for us to serve God? Why do we wait for us to get it all together, have all our addictions handled, have all our sin dealt with, in order to really begin serving God? God uses lots of things that you and I otherwise would not choose to use because God is magnified in really using broken things and making them new, repairing them, restoring them, and then putting them to work. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, you might want to check out the full video right here, as well as another teaching that YouTube selected just for you. Don't forget to like this video to help us reach more people and subscribe for more biblical content just like this. And thank you so much for partnering with us financially to make this global ministry possible. Our mission is to move people towards Jesus by teaching them how to read the Bible so they can live and teach the Bible themselves. Be sure to check out the website and keep moving towards Jesus. I'll see you in the next video.